Father. Oh, hello. Thank you for doing an interview with us. I'm Phyllis. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Father Marcus Holden. First question is asking about your childhood. How was your childhood? I had a very blessed childhood, really, a very happy one. I have to thank God for that. It was a very ordinary family, a humble family, brought up in the north of England first, and then we, we moved when I was seven to Wales. Uh, my mum and dad are, are very loving people. I have one brother who's now married. He has six children, he's very blessed. <laughs> but it was a very ordinary family. I went to ordinary schools and I was very much like everybody else. You wouldn't have guessed that I would become a, a priest from, from, my, from my upbringing. We always went to mass on a Sunday and we often said some prayers before bed, but we weren't a very religious family when I was growing up. Until about the age of 11, when my parents underwent a kind of spiritual conversion, they, they received a, a powerful gift from the Lord. And sometimes that happens in a family and it can have a huge effect. So from that time, I remember we started praying the rosary together as a family oh, wow. and talking about spiritual things. And I think that had a, a big influence. And then I was more conscious of my Catholic faith because I went to non-Catholic schools, especially my secondary school, was uh, just a secular school and I had to become quite conscious of my faith and being slightly different then at that point in my life that I would talk about God and pray but it can be quite a challenge when you're you're slightly different from from the others but I but I was just an ordinary young boy for all intents and purposes I used to play football I was very keen on football uh, I, I love to play out and um, I, I really enjoyed my childhood. Okay, so Father, who and what inspired you as a teenager? Well, I began, as I said, to be inspired first by my parents. They underwent quite a big conversion. I think they realized that God was real and that God acts in the world and that miracles take place and all that had an effect upon me. And I was also inspired by some other young people who had decided to be different to everybody else. They decided not to go the way of all the others um, and choosing a worldly life and a sinful life, but they'd chosen to, 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 follow, to follow Jesus. Uh, and they were a great inspiration to me uh, at that stage. That helped me in my faith. And then I began to think of becoming a priest because I was quite inspired by some priests that I'd seen and that helped me to begin to think about a vocation. How did it happen, uh, your vocation? Well, I remember it was a certain time in my life. You know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a young boy following the ways of the world, being affected by the world, uh, I was just carried along in, in, particular, in a particular lifestyle. But when I got to the age of 15, I remember making a choice to make a really good confession. And it was on Divine Mercy Sunday. And I had a football ticket to go to watch Manchester United at the time. And my parents were going to Divine Mercy. And they said, you can choose the, the football match or Divine Mercy. And I said, OK, I'm going to go to Divine Mercy. And I think that act of generosity, that little sacrifice, had a huge effect because on that day, I decided to make a really good confession of my life and then I think it was like a, a dam opening and grace came into my life and I remember just realizing that God really loved me and it was that love was so powerful and I think it was from that time at that moment in my life that I discovered my vocation that I, I knew that God wanted me to do something unique to be a priest or to enter the religious life, it became clear if God loved me so much, I should respond in a radical way. There was nothing else for it. It, it made complete sense. And from that time, I've never doubted that call. It's been with me from that moment. Oh, wow. that's very inspiring, Father, because at the age of 15, yes, the age of you, 15. you can actually choose your vocation at such age. I think that's inspiring because I'm 25 and I'm still thinking about my vocation, so that's very helpful. But it happens at different ages, you know. Some, I know some priests who wanted to be priests from when they were really young. And I know some nuns who wanted to be nuns since they were 
10 years old, but others uh, feel the call much later in life, 30, 40, even later. Um, so it's God's call, it's his time. You know, the apostles were all different ages. And so there's no rule to this. <laughs> there is no. So are there any priests, bishops, pope, or uh, any religious ladies who have inspired you or do you have a certain favorite one you say, this person has helped me with my journey to be, to choose your vocation? Yes, well, there are many people who inspire me and, and many priests. Uh, and some of the people I was training to be a priest with, some of the seminarians, these are people who'd given their whole life to God and often they could have had great careers in the world, they could have been rich, they could have had, you know, many beautiful things, um, but they chose God, which is the, the most beautiful thing of all. And they, they've inspired me. I think the Pope who inspired me, well, two Popes have really inspired me in my life. When I started to train to be a priest, I was sent to Rome to be a seminarian, and John Paul II was there. Oh. And he was suffering at the end of his life. And I think that endurance that he showed at the end of his life was, was a real inspiration. And all that he did for the church, he was a great missionary pope. But I also met and had chance to read quite a lot of the writings of Pope Benedict. And he was very, very deep, a great scholar, very, very gentle, very humble. But what he, what he conveyed to me was the sense that all this is real. Yes. Um, Jesus is real. His coming was true. What he gave to the world was, was true. Uh, and Pope Benedict expresses that so well. He's convinced both in mind and in heart. Uh, and I think we need both. And that was an inspiration to me. Oh, wow. So, Father, who's your favorite saint and why? <laughs> well, I, it's hard to answer that question because there's so many favorites. But I have to say Our Lady. I mean, she's the greatest saint. And I remember a story when I was young, and this was part of my vocation, I think, that, um, you know, I've just mentioned we always prayed the rosary. But one day, it was my birthday, I think it was my 16th birthday, and my mother bought me a present. And I opened it, and it was a book called True Devotion to Mary. And as a 16-year-old, you can imagine thinking, what kind of present is this? I never read a religious book in my life. And so I was really disappointed with it. And I didn't show any appreciation. Mm. And then afterwards, I felt guilty about it because my mother had gone and found this book for me. And it was there at the side of my bed. And it used to bug me. It was, like, it was a picture of Our Lady on the front. It was called True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis Marie de Montfort. And then through sheer guilt and uh, through not being thankful to my mother, I began to read this book. And it had a profound effect upon me. It showed me that to be devoted to Our Lady is to be truly devoted to Christ. Yes. And it had a huge impact. It made me strong to resist temptations. It made me clear in my mind about who I was and where I was going. And that devotion to Our Lady has stayed with me all of my life. But of course I have other favorite, favorite saints as well, like the Curie of Ars, who's the patron saint of parish priests, who is a real inspiration. He, transformed a parish where no one was believing into a, a parish filled with faith. Oh, wow. And I also love um, St. Augustine because I'm the rector of St. Augustine's shrine and he's a great missionary saint, an evangelist, he yeah. and he traveled all the way to England to, to talk about uh, Christ and the, and the faith and transform the country. He landed nearby to Ramsgate, so just off the coast, near to here where we're, we're talking now, and this church is the shrine of St. Augustine to commemorate that landing. And he was very brave. He came to a country that was pagan, to the Anglo-Saxon people, and he proclaimed the message. He could have been killed or banished or uh, locked away in some dungeon, but he wasn't. The message is, is true and it touches every human heart because we're made for this knowledge of God and of Jesus. He came for all people. He's God made man. And Augustine knew this, and it connected with these Anglo-Saxon people. Uh, and Augustine went on to, to build churches and to baptize thousands of people in this country. And through his holy life and the miracles that were worked through him, England stage by stage became a Christian country. And so we say that this shrine is a commemoration of the landing 
It's ground zero for evangelization. And it's also the place to inspire uh, conversion of England and this land today. Can you please tell me about your seminary years? Is when you decide to follow a call to the priesthood, you don't get ordained immediately. It takes several years. It actually takes six, seven or more years. I, I was six years in the seminary of the English College in Rome where English martyrs had trained to be priests to come back to England in the times of persecution in this land. So it's a place of heroism and that was a great inspiration for me to be sent to Rome and to be near the Pope as well and people from all over the world training to be priests. And while you're in seminary, and this is a big part of your life, if you decide to follow the call to be a priest, you learn about philosophy, how to talk about God and about the soul and about the meaning of life. And you learn about theology, all about the sacred scriptures, about church history, about the creed and what God has revealed. And you go into these things in, in great detail and it gives you understanding, and strength and knowledge. And also during those years, you also grow in your inner strength. You become more spiritual. You have time to pray, to think, to grow in virtue, to get rid of bad habits. And so and some people say to me, I can't become a priest because I'm not worthy. But none of us are worthy. Mm. And the time of seminary is, is a time to become ready, as ready as you can be. So you don't go in to train to be a priest as the finished product. You go in so that you can discern and grow and develop. And it's a wonderful, a wonderful time, although it, it is challenging because you're, you're changing and you're learning. But by the end of it, you're in a position to give your whole life on your ordination day, to say yes to God. And it's at that moment that, that you become a priest. Do you remember your ordination day and your first mass? Oh, that's a very nice question. I, I remember it very, very well indeed. And um, you get a little bit nervous because your, your life is going to change from that point. You know that. And everybody you've ever known and loved, well, most of them are there, present, behind you. And at your ordination, what happens is you lie flat on the ground, your face down, and it's like giving your whole life to God. And it's a beautiful sign. And when you get up from that moment of lying down and the litany of saints is prayed and invoked around you, the bishop lays his hands on your head and you're changed forever. We believe there's a, an inner change. We call it an ontological change, change of your being. And that will last even beyond this life for eternity. And so when you get up from lying down, it's, it's very, very moving. And the next day is your day of your first mass. And I remember after my ordination, I was so tired. I slept so well. And then I, I woke up the next morning and I had to sort of realize I'm a priest now oh, and I'm going to say mass. And the first mass, when you lift the host, which the bread that has become Christ's body, you lift the chalice, the wine that has become Christ's blood in sacrifice, you are moved profoundly. And every day of your life then, I can say it for myself, every day of my life is either moving towards the altar or coming from the altar to the people and to the work of evangelization and sanctification. But it's all defined by the Mass. And that was my first Mass. It was, uh, it was very, very moving. I was a bit trembly. Oh. Um, I always worried in case my hands would shake. <laughs> um, but, you know, God gives you the strength. I used to be very nervous reading mm. and public speaking, but once you start off, you get a grace to continue. So we should never be, be afraid. But after that, you have a series of first masses. I went home after that day to Wales, to my family church, where my parents lived, and another big celebration. And at the, there's a beautiful tradition at your first mass that stays with you forever. It does. Uh, after the ordination, after the first mass, you invite people to come forward for first blessings. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. People kneel down and you, you give them a first blessing and many of the people just kiss your hands. And that can seem really strange because you're a bit embarrassed, but it's not for you that they're doing it. They realize that now you have become a sacrament, that you represent Christ to them. And this is so humbling. And all the people you've known and loved, you bless with all your heart. And then they, they kiss your hands that have been anointed with oil so that they can bless 
and offer the Holy Eucharist and forgive sins and sanctify the world. And it's from those first blessings that all the priestly blessings of your life flow forth and continue. Father, when you're talking about the beginning of your priesthood, you just had this joy, this, you just glow when you're talking about it. I mean, where do you find all this joy in priesthood life? I think we gain joy by following Christ. And if he has a particular plan for us, that will be our joy. And we have to follow the vocation to, to have the full joy in our life. When we've given up sins and we're trying to follow the Lord and we're being faithful to him, he gives joy to the heart. And we know where we're in the place we're supposed to be. Every step along the way is a step of grace and has meaning forever. Uh, and that, that, that gives joy. And the priesthood is, is, is a challenging life. Yes, we give up many things and we have many challenges in the priesthood. Um, but the Lord supplies us with a, a hundredfold. He promised this in the Bible to his apostle. And it's absolutely true. He, he, he always outgives us in generosity. And I can honestly say every day of the priesthood is filled with great joy in that sense, even amidst the challenges. Mm. So in an ordinary day of a priest, we, we offer mass, but we are also talking to people, seeing them come alive in Christ. You see great conversions, you witness miracles, you see healing, you can forgive people's sins in confession and see them begin to have joy again in, in their life. And you're also baptizing babies and seeing the families so joyful with new life. You can help other people in their vocation, sometimes and often to be married. You can share that joy of the, of the, of the marriage day. And a priest gives up being married so that he can be a father to the whole church. And the Lord supplies his joy in doing that. And a very profound aspect of priesthood that, that does give joy but is challenging is working with the sick and the dying, that you can be Christ to them. Yes. And whenever I visited a hospital or been on the round to visit the sick people, I always come away knowing that Christ has worked through me uh, and that gives joy too. And you can see people home to heaven, which is ultimately why we do this. It makes everything worthwhile because we're dealing with things that last forever. Wow, so do you have any messages to all the young youths out there? How they can choose their vocation? How can you help them? Do you have a message for them on vocations? Well, I'd say do not be afraid because a lot of people hold back because they're worried about their own incapacity or their own sins. Um, and they think it's impossible to, to, be, to become what Christ wants them to become. They can hear a call deep within themselves. And the call isn't like a visible, uh, an audible voice, so you don't get a vision normally or anything like that. But you know deep down that the Lord is, is pulling you and you know that that's what you're meant to do. And it stays with you and it can be very powerful. But people hold back and are afraid to follow that call. But they need to trust in Christ. Do you know the, um, the passage from the Gospels where Jesus says to Peter, come out and walk on the water? Yes. And Peter doesn't want to do it. He's afraid. And eventually he starts to step out and then he begins to sink because he doubts. And Christ lifts him out. A vocation can feel a little bit like that. But we have to trust. And we can do anything if we trust in Christ. And in our vocation is found our happiness. And so we must have confidence in the Lord that He can make us what we're meant to become. Thank you, Father. Thank you. For yes. giving us this time. And I'm just so inspired. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Good to speak with you. Shalom um, World TV coming to Europe and coming to England. That's fantastic so that we can get the message of the good news out to people. I think many, many people of all ages, particularly young people, are searching. They're looking to hear a message in their language in a way that they can understand. And good Catholic media can serve that wonderful purpose of getting that news out there and encouraging and challenging people to 
find out a little bit more of the story of Jesus, which sadly so many people do not know or have forgotten. So it's great to hear this good news of Shalom World TV coming to the UK. May the Holy Spirit shower His blessings upon your work and your ministry in serving evangelization and the spreading of the good news of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.